Actually, I've got to apologize because I kind of procrastinated in preparing my remarks today, and I didn't realize what a kind of a daunting task this was going to be. So, uh, basically, what follows here is more of an anarchist um, criticism of civilization. But just so you know what anarcho-primitivism is, it's a trend within anarchism that advocates the destruction of civilization to realize a what they would consider a truly anarchist society. Also, it, uh, the uh, tenets that, uh, of anarchism that apply to humans, they apply that to the rest of the biological community and to the earth as well. So, freedom from unjust authority. All right. <clears throat> so, basically, uh, what I see as the difference between uh, Marxist communism and anarchism is that Marxists believe that uh, communist society must be organized and enforced through uh, the state, including the use of forced collectivization if ne necessary. Anarchists, on the other hand, believe humanity is naturally cooperative and communities will form effortlessly where they're needed if they're not being violently suppressed. It seems that the anarchist theory, to be justified, it requires a rather large precedent to rest on. Marxist theory requires no precedent as their society will be imposed on, human on humanity from by an enlightened vanguard. Some anarchists use the Paris Commune, Anarchist Spain, or May 68 as this precedent. But it seems that a true precedent needs to be lo a long-lasting and sustainable one in order to hold any water in the battle of ideas. Has there ever been a long-lasting a long, a long society based on cooperation and sharing with, minimal amount of, with a minimal amount of coercion? Yes, there has. In 1492, Christopher Columbus got lost and ran into a continent he didn't know existed. It was there that a new people and an unfamiliar way of life were made known to the Europeans. When Columbus first arrived uh, and encountered, encountered the Arawak Indians, he said, the Indians are so naive and so free with their possessions that no one who has not witnessed them would believe it. When you ask for something they, uh, they have, they never say no. To the contrary, they offer to share with everyone. Uh, immediately after that, he goes on to write about how he enslaved a whole bunch of them. Um, Dale Van Every uh, writes in the book the, Dis the Disinherited, the foundation principle of Native American government had always been the rejection of government. The freedom of the individual was, regard was regarded by practically all Indians north of Mexico as a canon infinitely more precious than the individual's duty to his community or nation. This anarchist attitude ruled all behavior, beginning with the smallest social unit, the family. The Indian parent was constitutionally reluctant to discipline his children. Their very ex exhibition of self-will was accepted as favorable, favorable indication of maturing character. <clears throat> so Europeans at the, uh, at the time uh, believed that social stratification was just an unavoidable fact of life. The discovery of social systems free from poverty and rigid hierarchical government turned this assumption on its head. The desirability of this way of life must have been readily apparent to the rank and file of early American settlers. Um, Michel William Jean de Crevecoeur, in Letters from an American Farmer, wrote the following. There must be, in their social bonds, something singular, singularly captivating and far superior to anything to be boasted among us. For thousands of Europeans are Indians, and we have no examples of even one of the, those Aborigines having from choice become Europeans. Ben Franklin made this even more clear when he said, no European who has tasted savage life can afterwards bear to live in our societies. The power structure of European civilization quickly set about destroying the Native American societies. When they, were not, when they were not killed, they were simply subjected to the cross and the plow, removed from their land, and their societies crumbled. The European power structure did this partially out of want for the Natives' land and resources, and partly because a, a successful egalitarian society cannot be toler tolerated by an exploitative one. If workers and slaves are aware that their position in society is not the only imaginable state of affairs, how long can exploitation endure? Before long, the natives were exterminated and marginalized. Until now, they are largely thought of as a romantic element of the past and nothing more. Today, we face a situation in which the exploitative ideology of civilization permeates society so universally that it is largely invisible. No alternatives exist. We live at the end of history, and everything that happened before was only in preparation for this. Or so the story goes. From for some, the memory of the egalitarian societies of Native America would not fade so quickly. And what was more remarkable was that as civilization marched to the ends of the earth, similar societies were discovered in all the untouched places. 
Furthermore, scientific discoveries would reveal that mankind was not a mere 6,000 years old, as some would have say that the Bible would have us believe, but at least 100,000 years old, maybe even up to 3 million years old, and that our ancestors lived very similarly to the indigenous people of the, Amer of the Americas and to the world. An uh, anthropology and archaeology reveal much about humanity that has been forgotten by the civilized world. Anthropologist Richard Lee said, before the rise of the state and the entrenchment of social inequality, people lived for millennia in small-scale kin-based social groups, in which the core institutions of economic life included collective or common ownership of land and resources, generalized reciproc reciprocity in the distribution of food, and relatively egalitarian political relations. Chris Hartman expounds upon this. People shared with and helped each other with no rulers and no rule, no rich and no poor, Lee echoes the phrase used by Frederick Engels in the 1880s to describe this state of affairs, primitive communism. The point is of enormous importance. Our species is over 100,000 years old. For 95% of this time, it has not been characterized at all by many forms of behavior ascribed to human nature today. There is nothing built into our biology that makes present day societies the way they are. <clears throat> the idea, um, the idea that the lives in, in the, of these early band societies and later tribal societies were nasty, brutish, and short, to borrow from Hobbes' phrase, from Hobbes, is fictitious. Richard Lee, in studying the, uh, the Kung Indians who lived in the radical desolation of the Kalahari Desert, found that this band of hunter-gatherers satisfied their needs easily and only needed to work about three to four hours a day. Studies of other hunter-gatherer tribes in Arnhem Land, Australia, by McCarthy and MacArthur, and the Mabudi of the African Congo by Colin Turnbull reflects similar findings. Anthropologist Marshall Salins famously declared hunter-gatherer society to be the original affluent society. Uh, so it seems our precedent, is a, our precedent for an anarchist society is established. But the question remains, what are the differences between our society and tribal and band society that make ours so stratified and they're so egalitarian. If we look at tribal and band societies, the most distinguishing features that they have in common are, one, that the social unit is much smaller than in civilized society, b, that they are lacking in large-scale systems of technology, and c, domestication is minimal if not entirely absent, and social stratification seems to increase along with the amount of domestication present. Now, we shouldn't just assume that these features are necessarily the cause of their egalitarian tendencies, but there is evidence to, success to suggest that they are causally related. We should be able to look at human history and see where major shifts in social organization occurred. In this way, we may, able, we, we may be able to deduce their causes. Chris Hartman, writing in A People's History of the World, says, the first big changes in people's lives and ideas began to occur only about 10,000 years ago. People took up a new way of making a livelihood in certain parts of the world, notably the Fertile Crescent region of the Middle East. They learned to cultivate crops instead of relying upon nature to provide them with vegetable foodstuffs, and to domesticate animals instead of simply hunting them. It was an innovation which was to transform their whole way of living. One way it did this uh, was by increasing the birth rate of tribal societies. Um, in a hunter-gatherer society, basically, uh, women need to be able to carry their, their young with them, so they would usually space children out for at least three years, or three, even up to five years, until the kid was able to walk by himself. Also, I've read that a, uh, a diet con um, consisting largely of greens increases your fertility rate. Um, <clears throat> This, combined with a new sedentary lifestyle of some horticultural societies, led to the first villages and the first stores of food, which provided incentive for other tribes to raid them. Um, and as Hartman says, war virtually, war, virtually unknown in hunter, among hunter-gatherers, was endemic among many horticultural peoples. Still, most horticultural societies managed to retain a largely non-stratified social existence. This is the state in which Europeans found many Native American tribes, who often combined nomadic hunting and gathering with small, smaller scale horticulture. Until around 5,000 years ago, with the origin of civil, uh, until and this was the state of affairs until around 5,000 years ago, with the origin of civilization in the rigid sense, a, a society based upon cities. The first civilizations arose mainly in the Middle East and along the Indus River. 
but they were also <clears throat> but they also emerged independently in Central America and the Andes. Social stratification exploded in these societies. It is at this time when we see tablets engraved with, for the first time with the symbol for slave girl. Archaeology of these early civilizations show a great unequal distribution of wealth. In the ancient Sumerian city of, Ish, of Ishuna, we see a few large houses with about uh, two, uh, 200 square meters of floor area, while the vast majority of houses in the city have only about 50 square meters. These civilizations were the first in his history to subsist almost entirely on domesticated food. And um, <clears throat> in Chris Hart, this is a quote from Chris Hartman again. Grain was stored in sizable buildings, which, standing out from the surrounding land, came to symbolize the continuity and preservation of social life. Those who had supervised the granaries became the most prestigious group in society, overseeing the life of the rest of the population as they gathered in, stored, and distributed the surplus. The storehouses and their controllers came to seem like powers over and above society. The key to its success, which was the key to its success, which demanded obedience and praise from the mass of people. They took on an almost supernatural aspect. The storehouses were the first temples, their superintendents the first priests. The combination of an exploding population, a uh, constant destruction of the local environment, as is the case when, uh, when you know, large-scale ag agriculture is practiced because the, natu the natural vegetation needs to be cleared out and replaced often with a monocrop. When that happens, uh, massive soil erosion sets in and nutrient depletion also sets in. So this is called this process called desertification. Topsoil, required, it, which is only present in climax ecosystems, requires thousands of years to develop. It's very quickly washed away when these practices set in, though. <clears throat> uh, and also the inabilities of cities to provide their own resources made civilization a massive, all-consuming war machine. Constant military expansion, imperialism, and colonialism are some of the defining features of civilization. Native American author Jack D. Forbes calls this the Wedigo disease. Wedigo is a Native American word for cannibal, consumers of human flesh. He says to a considerable degree the development of the Wedigo disease corresponds to the rise of what Europeans call civilization. This is no mere coincidence. He goes on to say a society is only highly esteemed by the writers of civilization when it produces huge monuments, impressive public works, accumulates great surplus wealth, and has a leisure class. The creation of such material products or their, uh, or their accumulation is, of course, closely associated with imperialism and stratified social systems. Therefore, the European thinker tends to greatly admire empires and authoritarian societies. It is pre precisely these kinds of societies which are where you go. They are the ones where explo exploitation of others is accepted, at least by the rulers, as a proper or at least necessary way of life. <clears throat> Philosopher Lewis Mumford wrote of, wrote of democracy and its relationship to the scale of society. He said, democracy, in the primal sense, I shall use the term, is necessarily most visible in relatively small communities and groups, whose members meet frequently face to face, interact freely, and are known to each other as persons. As soon as large numbers are involved, democratic association must be su supplemented by a more abstract, depersonalized form. Historic experience shows that it is much easier to wipe out democracy by an institutional arrangement that gives authority only to those at the apex of the social hierarchy than it is to incorporate democratic practices into a well-organized system under centralized direction, which achieves the highest degree <clears throat> of mechanical efficiency when those who work it have no mind or purpose of their own. <clears throat> the tension between small-scale association and large-scale organization, between personal autonomy and institutional regulation, between remote control and diffused local intervention, has now created a critical situation. If our eyes had been open, we might long ago have discovered this conflict deeply embedded in technology itself. Now, having uh, addressed domestication and scale, we can now move on to technology. Here I will be addressing the system of technology as, as it is, exists in industrialized countries. In the early 1800s, British textile artisans rebelled against the Industrial Revolution by attack attacking mechanized looms. <clears throat> the Industrial Revolution was wreaking havoc on their way of life, forcing the artisans out of their homes in the country and into the filthy, smog-ridden urban centers. They were now forced to work for wealthy capitalists who could afford the large mechanized looms and completely, reord and completely reordering society without their consent. 
The Luddite social movement gained so much support and momentum that, the mach that machine breaking was a crime punishable by death. And at one time, there were more British soldiers fighting the, Lud fighting the Luddites than the forces of Napoleon. They were ultimately defeated, though. But there is a lesson to be learned from them. The system, the system of technology has incredible effects on Pond society, and one of its more important aspects is its acceleration of the destruction of communities and the biosphere. Industrialism, writes Kirkpatrick Sale, is characterized by the squeezing of farm populations and the uncontrollable growth of cities, the evisceration of self-reliant self communities, the enlargement of central governments, the enthronement of science as ruling ideology, a wide and increasing gap between rich and poor, and ruling values of profit, growth, property, and consumption. It was so in the early 19th century of Britain, in the late 19th century of the United States, the 20th century of Japan, and seems indeed <clears throat> to be so in the process of industrialization everywhere. Let's take, uh, for one example, uh, television. The, the, the Diné Indians uh, were a tribe living in northwest, the Northwest Territories of Canada, and until recently were some of the last remaining Native American tribes who still retain, retain degree of autonomy and community that, were, that was found in most tribes before the closing of the frontier. But they were under constant bar bombardment by, among others, cable television companies. After a long period of resistance, the Diné family gave in, and satellite dishes were installed. The effects were fast, and their traditional society disintegrated equally as fast. Members of the tribe stopped visiting one another, and instead stayed in their homes to watch television. And the values communicated through television were those of the white oppressors. This is not, this is not due to what was on television. This is due to the nature of television which is not a means, a democratic means for communicating information between individuals. Television is necessarily a, ce a centralized technology which disperses from, one, from generally one small source to the rest of the population. Similar effects can be seen on society, uh, similar effects can be seen on society with inventions such as telephones, the internet, and cars, which as they have been introduced to societies have, have universally resulted in the large-scale destruct, uh, destruction of those communities. And, um, yeah, now for my rousing conclusion. In the late 1800s, after the frontier was closed, and the natives living in the United States were all but destroyed, a spiritual leader named Wovoka created the Ghost Dance, which promised to destroy the, the imperialist white culture, free the Indians, and return the herds of buffalo. Anarcho-primitivists <coughs> are modern-day ghost dancers. They are Luddites rebelling against a dystopic future dreamt up by a barbarous technocracy which consumes all in its path. technology and no to civilization about uh, how can this be implemented or can you tell us more about how that can be implemented sure yeah and, that's the and thing uh, maintained across the globe okay sure uh, and that's kind of the thing I didn't really have time to get to when I was preparing this but I mean basically yeah implementation is obviously the largest problem with the anarcho primitivist project um, basically <laughs> anarcho primitivists don't um, say that we need to abstain from the use of technology in our everyday lives. They look, at tech, they look at the system of technology and see that as it is imposed in societies that it has these destructive effects. That does not mean that we cannot use the, um, the tools of technology against you know, oppressive systems such as civilization, right? Like Native Americans use guns to fight against the cavalry, things like that. Um, as far not as- Not just the fight against the cavalry. What's that? Not just the fight against the cavalry. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, they used Sure, guns. They, they used guns. Once they, once yes, but, they but, but, gained access to that technology, they used that technology because it was advantageous. Sure, but and, they did. But only by something like taboos, which we don't really have access to in our world in the same way that tribal uh, societies. I mean, taboos, that's, that's how it works, you know. There's a taboo on maybe 
shooting this, that, or the other. Well, we do, we do, but not no. in the same way. Okay, yeah. but in order, but in order for Indians, okay, Indians use guns, which they purchase from the whites. In order for Indians to adopt guns as a system of technology, right? They would need to, they would need to adopt the industrial structure, which which mass produce guns. They didn't do this. And if they were to do this, this would have transformed their society radically, and they would have probably more resembled the white society. Um, as far as how this could be maintained across the globe, that's a pretty darn good question. Uh, what I would say is that, is that civilizations rise and fall throughout the history of civilizations. When they fall, people, the trend is, is that the people go back to decentralized ways of life, right? When the Roman Empire fell, that's how slavery in the Roman Empire was ended. They returned to, uh, you know, to decentralized uh, small-scale farming and things like that, which eventually degenerated into feudalism and then gave rise to another civilization. But I, I, I don't necessarily know that, that we can ever be completely free of civilization. What I do think is that we can, that, uh, we can, resist, civiliz we can resist civilization and that civilizations can collapse and we can at least buy some time before the next one uh, arises. Okay. Um, I noticed a, a couple things that seemed incongruent. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll touch on a, a few of them in, in, in your talk. Okay. Um, you talked about the Luddites, right? And then you talked about uh, that the growth of uh, civilization in England during the Industrial Revolution and here at the MD uh, um, entailed profit, growth, and property, right? And it, it seems, and then of course, right, you talked about the TV bombarding this this culture, um, and then it seems that going all the way back, the the central question of which technology is sort of a, a, a prop for, is the question of the individual against the organization. And that the organization generates these things like profit, growth, and property, but and can also do so in incredible qualities. But in doing so, right, has to suppress the individual, right, and it, this creates a sort of tension. But it seems that there's a fundamental flaw with this notion of the distinction or incommensurability of the individual of the organization, and this goes to one of the most important modern, uh, well. Well, no, just one of the most important notions in the history of humanity. And I would encourage you to read uh, Niccolo Machiavelli's Discourses on Titus Livy, because Dick, uh, Machiavelli was one of the greatest democratic thinkers. But it's the notion of republicanism, right? And the notion of republicanism entails that one's organization simultaneously is caught up and expresses the will of the individual in its functioning. And so in this case, right, it seems that the organization itself is not necessarily contrary to the individual will. And if you have a properly republican state or organization or centralization, right, then it's not at all difficult to have a popular will expressed. Um, for example, the television, TV bombarding, and it creates the white oppressor's uh, message, right, and generates it. Um, what I think pretty constantly through most of these critiques of technology is what is happened is cause is mistaken for effect. It seems quite clear that the native people adopt where they're not coercively forced to, right? When natives or indigenous groups adopt the cultural mores of Western powers, that doesn't show the efficacy and strength of Western powers that shows the degeneration of will and community already present. Um, because you could very easily have a poor, virtuous republic. And in fact, the success of Rome was literally based on, during its strongest republican phase, on being a poor, virtuous republic. And in fact, right, uh, Maximilian uh, Quintinius, uh, Cincinnatus, right, of which we have a city named Cincinnati, was so poor that he had to plow his fields himself by hand. And his, uh, but yet he himself, because of his virtue and skill, was twice elected dictator of Rome and was constantly aggravated while defending Rome in this purely Republican fashion 
that by the time he returned home, his finances would be ruined because he took nothing from the Republic. And so, I, I mean, the, the, the cut of my critique should be obvious here, but I'll pose it as a very simple question. How would you respond to those who say that centralization and organization can properly express individual will if they have proper egalitarian and republican virtues? Um, I don't know how I would respond to that question. Okay. That, that's a fair answer. How do they have a response to that question? Do they have a good response? I also don't know the answer to that question. Well, would it I, just be an anarchist response? Any man over a man is still a pro the problem. The problem is men over men. And so if you try to elect a, uh, a guy, even how virtuous, how great, how wonderful a person he is, if you elect him to be a leader, he's still over you. And it's still, in, in, it's still uh, inflicting into your individual freedom. And so that's the reason why, is that uh, anarcho primitivism at least anarchism, is that it's for individual freedom. If I'm, thank you. Sure. Um, but I, I think what happens is then there's an obscuring that's occurring here, which is that a political institution is not a man. And yes, political institutions or a human being, more, more properly, um, right? Uh, a political institution is not a human being. And someone vested with power from a political institution does not entail the same rights of naked domination of an individual over an individual. And I think the Roman dictator is a great example of this, which is to say, when Rome is threatened deeply enough, uh, and again, Rome is not perfect, but I think Rome is uh, a so much a valuable model that the French Revolution itself modeled after the Roman Republic. Um, but when Rome was threatened enough, right, it was possible, legally possible, and theoretically possible, and non-controversial, right, to elect a speaker who could not make constitutional changes, but who had um, something like absolute authority in these times of crisis. Now, there's a big difference between this model and the model of, say, Hitler, or George W. Bush, or the Patriot Act, which is that decision of ancient Rome was a properly Republican one. Um, as good as ancient societies get, right? I mean, I mean it, it, we're, we're talking about landholders, often very small landholders, but landholders nonetheless. And obviously women and slaves were not included. Um, but within the Republic proper, right, that was a, which is a big caveat, which, uh, and I, I don't ever want to denigrate that, but I think we have reached a level where that isn't necessarily the single most important issue. But within that republic, there was nothing controversial about electing someone with the authority to protect the republic. And I mean, it, despite, I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to make this next step though, right? And so this is why I'm very hesitant of the slings and arrows cast at, in a simple way, cast at the Soviet, you know, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the People's Republic of China, right? So just a small historical thing there, sorry. Well, well um, I was curious how much uh, um, anarcho-primitivists would, would advocate that ideology just due to the idea of the combination of technology and capitalism just putting us on a path where we live in really unsustainable ways so that in, a, in contrast to Native American communities, for example, where they lived in a way where they didn't destroy the environment, they lived in sustainable ways that could persist indefinitely, as opposed to say, um, you know, in a civilization, even not necessarily capitalist, but even say the way the Soviet Union ran things because they obviously were good with technology and did a lot of environmental damage and things like that. But the importance of the idea of just saying, you know, because of technology and development, industrialization, et cetera, we're living in a way that just can't be sustained because we're destroying the environment. And maybe that's the reason that this current civilization, which has expanded across the entire globe, essentially will essentially fall just due to the environmental damage we're doing. Like how much does that 
play into their thinking as opposed to just the idea of, like, say, a typical anarchist who would be opposed to exploitation and one person ruling over another? Oh, it plays a, a great role. I mean, most anarcho-primitivists uh, basically hold the idea that civilization is going to fall no matter what, as it has throughout the history of civilizations. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, yeah, and, and specifically due to the fact that, that civilizations, by their very nature, overexploit their environment. Because yeah, I can see a big difference in, say, the fall of Babylon or the fall of Rome, and, say, the fall of, if our civilization were to fall, just because of massive differences in what we're doing to the environment. But, I mean, still, the environmental thing is there with even those ancient civilizations because they, you know, with their, with their agriculture, they caused desertification in the places where they lived. So they had to go out, and they had to go out and conquer others of the other uh, societies whose topsoil and things like that were not depleted so they could get their resources. Eventually, they stretched themselves too thin and couldn't support that, and so they collapsed. So it is, I mean, you know, there are other factors that come into that, you know, like where, you know, Slaves revolting, or people in in, uh, in the colonies revolting, and things like that. But at, at its fundamental core, it is an in, it's an environmental problem. Um, yeah. So I had a question. You made a comment about um, so this Native American tribe, it's TV, and there's this centralized source where you know these values and, uh, and such come from, and it's spreading out to a mass of people. And this is like something that's critiqued by anarcho primitivists. Mm -hmm. Um, is the converse relationship a source of, like, would they critique that as well? Namely, like, the collective will, the community, coming up against a particular individual in some way and sort of trying to influence them in the same way that a centralized, like, value would influence a whole community? Or is that something that an anarcho primitivist would encourage, right? The community. Um, well, I mean, obviously, you know, Native Americans and things like that gathered together in councils and things like that uh, to. Uh, you know, to make collective decisions and things like that. But I think the point is, is that this is that with anarcho-primitivism, the important part is the scale of the society in which those dis in which those discussions happen. Right? Like the, the people who in, are involved in these communal decisions all know each other, all know their interests, and are all you know have interests in the, in uh, those other people's interests. Right? And so, so they would say that a, that local control would be far superior to. Remote control. So, collective will is is justifiably or is justifiable is acceptable so long as that that will reflects a community of people who like know each other personally, right? And can, can sure get yeah. each other in that way. And that that's more of my opinion. I'm sure there are some anarcho-primitivists who would probably have problems with collective will as well. But, yeah. Uh, can you? Oh yeah. Um, uh, just, just I guess two. There, there's a few things. Uh, a little, like a small comment on the reliability of. Um, I would question the reliability of Columbus's testimony, just because of not because it's necessarily wrong, but there's a reason why he would be writing whatever he's writing. He was writing. Uh, it seems to me, like just comments straight up, a pretty romanticized view of of uh, the reality of a primitive life. Um, this idea that it's, at, I de I'm suspicious uh, whether or not it's as bad, egalitarian, mm -hmm. and but the biggest problem is intertribal conflicts, which is the beginning, the grounds of class conflict. Once racial domination, it starts out. In other words, there's a myth about you know feudal society that there were protectors, and then there were there were workers. But in fact, the protectors were the ones that came and killed off you know, the strongest of, 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 a, of, a, of a tribe and made the, made the rest of the tribe the workers. Then they, were the, then they became, they said, we're your protectors now. Right? And they, they were never, it was basically racial domination turned into class. Mm -hmm. and, it, and racial domination is possible because people are identifying um, overly locally. And um, since it is, it sounds to me that like uh, anarcho-primitivism is more of a prediction about how things are going to be than like an actual pro. Like there's there aren't like a bunch of concrete steps uh, that are super realistic about how globally to um, implement it. 
I, I would say that that is something that any anarcho primitivist should look, take a hard look at. Uh, yeah, I agree. There's no status. The, the, we're going to go back to just a really, really racist world. Hmm. I don't know about that. But, I mean, possibly in the, like... Provincial, racist, like, we're this, you're that. Uh, and I mean, conflicts arrive. Native, 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 hold on. Native, Native, Native American tribes, in general, were much more accepting of other races than were the white societies at the time. Black runaway slaves. Oh, I don't mean by race, race. By white race, people. I do not mean blacks, whites, and Asians. You're talking about, you're talking mean, about tribal I differentiation. Mean race for me is tribe. Okay. My tribe versus your tribe. But what I'm saying people is, is that there are, is that there are many, many examples of white people running away from from, civiliz uh, from civilization, of black people running away from slavery, and joining up with the Native Americans. Right? I, I don't think it was. I mean, sure, like... You, but you're, you're but between Native American groups, there were conflicts. Absolutely, there were conflicts. There. And, and those, those kind of things would resurface, end out escalating, and you would have what you have all... I mean, the process would happen all over. It wouldn't stay stagnant and harmonious. I, I would, or at least I would like to like, think about how to have something that's, that doesn't just start the whole process over. Okay. Does that make I'm, sense? And it maintains a certain harmony between the local groups. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think that first off, tribal warfare differs greatly from uh, from modern industrialized warfare, or even just civilized warfare. In that, civilized it becomes eventually. I would say it becomes eventually modern civilized warfare. It starts out tribal. And I, I, I don't. I don't think that they are. I don't think that they are similar in that way. I think. I think tribal warfare is about maintaining boundaries, right? It's a, it's a form of populate of you know making sure people's populations don't get out of hand. So if, so occasionally they would initiate raids against other parties. It wasn't a large systematic fight to eliminate another tribe. It was a maintaining of boundaries. In this sense, it actually helped maintain the harmony that I'm talking about, as opposed to being antithetical to it. <coughs> Until one dis one gets very strong or very aggressive. And, and the way and the way that happens. And how how is that for, to be prevented? Well, how is that to be prevented? I'm not sure. I mean, that's obviously something that's going to have to be taken up when it happens. But you know, anarcho-primitivism is an ideology which is opposed to civilization, right? So it seems like. So, it, but it have to be a global, on a global level, an implementation of um, anarcho-primitivist ideology. So each local group couldn't have their own particular ideology. I mean, in the end, it wouldn't be that locally controlled. It would have to be something across them. Do you, do you get the? I, I get what you're saying. Problem, that in order, in order for anarcho-primitivism to work, it would need to be, it would need to be like imposed globally simultaneously. Somehow, or else you would have you would have conflicts. And how would the anarcho-primitivists win? I, I don't know. I mean, like you can pursue this line of questioning. You can ask your answer, but I also can yeah. take other right. questions. I'm, I'm basically stepping into moderating, so it calls on me. Okay. Call on me. Um, yeah, I want to talk about the, this notion of the fall of society. Um, I, I know that empires fall, but it seems like you know entire people aren't necessarily wiped out, and if they are, they're immediately replaced with other people and things like this. I mean, so. I mean, it's very romantic to use the words like the fall of Rome and stuff like that. You know, Rome, the people of Rome, they weren't defeated. Their empire fell, but it was replaced by feudalism. Feudalism didn't like, uh, didn't like. There was not this sort of weird vacuum where there was these weird hunter-gatherer societies or anything like that. It was immediately taken over by feudalism, and there was weird transitional states, but there was never any like sort of fall. I mean, it reminds me of the 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 the. the what Nietzsche said, second genealogy morals, right? In order for a double to fall, a new one must be in place, or something along those lines. Basically, you have to replace something with something else. There's no fall, there can be a fall of an empire, but there's never a fall of civilization. Civilization can be replaced, but it's never, it never falls. Um, I, All right, that, that's an actual question, though. What are your thoughts on that here? Okay. I, I, <laughs> I can put it in the form of I, I, I disagree, right? Okay. With the fall of Rome, um, yeah, that's that's one example where you have like other uh, other forces immediately moving in and taking over. But also, we don't know a whole ton about what happened after the fall of Rome because there's no writing and things like that. What we do know is that things 
things did tend to decentralize. Okay? But there are other civilizations which, which have fallen and which have not been replaced by other civilizations but have basically you know, returned to more tribal states of life. An example of this would be like Chaco Canyon down in New Mexico, right? They, like it was the, I believe, the Hobie, and their civilization fell and they returned back and became the, yeah, it became, went back to a tribal way of life. The, the, the tribal way of life is a, is a civilization. Uh, now everybody raises their hand for any question they want to ask. All right, fine. And, and I'm being the symbolic father, sorry. Um, I, if you want to follow up, basically, the, basically the whole point of my presentation was to differentiate between tribal and ends and a civilized mode of living, so I disagree with that. Uh, Chris. Certainly, thank you. Uh, I, real quick comment. Uh, it was the Germans who actually came in and smashed Rome and took yes. over. So civilization, taking over civilization. Um, I guess my first thing, right, this notion of civilization collapsing, you get this big with Derek Jensen, which I'm, I'm kind of disappointed you didn't mention, or Daniel Quinn, or John Zerzan. Yeah, I, I, I like some Zerzan. I like to ruin him. <laughs> but so this notion of civilization collapsing, right? Uh, it, it, what you get out of the critique is, hey, it's bound to happen, so we can do one of two things. Either wait for it to happen, or help slow it down so it's not a huge, terrible crash and kills more people than it should. But also, wouldn't necessarily entail that there's going to have to be some sort of collapse slash power down scenario. Um, and out of that, uh, it, it seems to me that in order for anarcho primitivism to work on a global scale, it's going to require at least two, one third to two thirds of the Earth's population dead. Like, no bones about it. Um, even, even if we were just to let it crash or let it slow down, that's going to be a necessary condition. Also, another necessary condition is we're going to have to have some sort of Garden of Eden to return to, which I don't think we have. Which it actually brings up the, the, the notion of the problematic, the very notion of nature itself is extremely problematic. Uh, it's, you say something like Aldo Leopold, who's like, hey, we should think like a mountain to get a different perspective about this. But what it, what it presupposes is that nature is wholly good and it's a great place to be. In that same sense, should we also think like a tectonic plate or think like a hurricane or a comet? Because I think the notion of nature becomes extremely problematic. And uh, basically, you're basically throwing people to the wolves as far as just, okay, civilization is here, everybody goes back to hunter-gatherers. So either there's a transition point where we slow it down and sort of do whatever, or we just sit around and wait for the collapse. I don't know what your thoughts. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, as you'll note, like, I kind of actually did this uh, refrain from using any actual anarcho-primitivists on purpose, and anyway, just with kind of more mainstream historians and philosophers. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as nature, you'll notice I didn't actually mention nature anywhere mm -hmm. in the presentation for that specific reason. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as uh, slowing down, okay. Well, A, like your question about nature is that we don't have a Garden of Eden to return to. Um, nor will we look the, longer this, the, the longer this civilization keeps existing, right? It's just going to keep on destroying and reducing biological um, diversity. So, I mean, like Derek Jensen says that we're going to need to, to like, the sooner we take down civilization, the better. Um, but both Derek Jensen and John Zerzan have made positive references to things such as permaculture, right? And that could be seen as a way to slow down, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of ease our way out of civilization by creating more sustainable localized communities. So there's not a fervent rejection of technology? Um, there is in, so there's an in, instrument, the, in the eventuality. So there's an instrument, I'm actually about to my <laughs> New. Or no, no. Uh, no um, I had a question earlier about like technology. Through an anarchist, anarcho uh, this is a point of view on technology. If like, because you know, today's technology it seems to have like long-term negative effects. Uh, would you think if we had some sort of control on technology, um, you know, whether that way we were aware of possible negative effects, would you think civilization? still might have a chance, or do you still think it would somewhat fail? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think if, if civilization does not learn to control its population, civilization you know, continues to deplete its own resources. These are, all, these are all problems with civilization independent of the technological problem. I do think, uh, with regard to technology, that, that uh, you know, we have examples of kind of more successful societies uh, that kind of maintain a non-capitalist stance who have, when in, in the adopting of technologies, have a more critical view towards the technology. They have a democratic, uh, democratic system set up which establishes if they should accept a technology which that has already been invented 
and how it should be accepted. The Amish, for instance, everybody thinks that they just reject technology offhand. What they actually do is that uh, they allow a technology to be around for a while, they see how it affects the rest of societies, then you know, the council of like, elders or whatever, they get together and they, and they talk about it and eventually they come to a conclusion, like some Amish societies, for instance, have telephones. But they decided that if they were to put telephones in, every, in each and every one for each and every one person's house, in on the whatever you call it, the farm or whatever, that that would cause that people would you know stop talking to each other, that people would be able to move away from each other, and the destruction of their community would follow. So they have one communal telephone for the entire village, I guess. Um, Devin. Kevin. Um, a couple things. Uh, first off, just two anthropology books that I've read. Um, one brought up points. It was a study of Papua New Guinea and a very primitive culture there. And <clears throat> brought up the stat that over about 50 to 70 percent, or you have about every adult male has about 50 to 70 percent chance of dying due to warfare, um, compared to about 3 to 5 percent or less um, among, among modern societies, as well as. <clears throat> A culture that I read uh, about Sub-Saharan Africa, I in Namibia. Um, most of uh, most adult males, uh, if they had reached the age of 30, they'd probably kill about five people, if not more. Um, and I think that um, my view is that civilization allows us contact with people um, that are different. And um, that, you know, have we, were we back to a primitive culture? People view these small differences as uh, you know, a reason to, to defend ourselves and to retreat back into our, our comfort zone and, and attack. Whereas when we come out, come in contact with, with other people, uh, this kind of uh, limitation that is allowed by civilization uh, allows us to, to view these as, as rather insignificant. Um, we've got Philo Farnsworth, who just mentioned the television, saying how you know, his dream of that was <coughs> to end war um, because that would. Um, drive from the humanity of culture that is in ours. Um, and ironically, and this is you know, going on technology, not civilization so much, but ironically, I came across, and I'm very new to anarchism, it's not my most passionate, <laughs> or my biggest passion, mm -hmm. but I came across Thursday last night for the first time, thanks to just building around the internet. Um, so it's kind of ironic that yeah. you know, I was exposed to these peaceful, um, more anarchic, but probably wouldn't have these tendencies were it not for civilization as byproduct of technology. So it seems like the more that we're able to integrate that, the more that we can view other people as similar to ourselves rather than resort to the type of civilization that exists in Papua New Guinea or in um, Namibia. And the stats seem to seem to back that up quite rather than the, as he pointed out, romanticized view of primitive culture. Um, yeah, uh, okay, like obviously primitive culture, like you know, I think any of the uh, anarcho primitives would actually admit that, yeah, it's not, it, they're not saints. They're not saying that they're saints. They're saying that they have established a, a basically stable matter of organizing society, right, that can exist for, you know, in a, in, in, that in America existed for at least 10,000 years, probably even more, even longer than that, right, that existed pretty stably without destroying their ecological land base that have basically an egalitarian society. And yeah, there are some there are some tribes that engaged in more warfare than others. That's unavoidable. Okay, but the point is, is that they are stable. Secondly, like the idea that like, okay, because so we we, we nitpick these like individual tribes that happen to be a little bit more warlike, <clears throat> which first off, I would like to point out that in this day and age there are very few, you know, uh, tribal societies that are unaffected by civilization. So I, I would maybe call into question you know, there are these tribes' relationship to civilization. In addition to that, tribal societies don't have the ability to kill on the scale that industrialized civilization does, right? Like, you know, would World War would World War One or Two or Vietnam would have any of those those catastrophes been possible if our if our if our society was on the scale of a hunter gatherer society? I, so. I agree with you at that point. The same, while the capacity might not be there to kill as many people, one person might not be able to kill as many people. Mm -hmm. If, as is the case in Libya, and, and granted this wasn't, um, had no political meaning whatsoever, the book that I read, mm -hmm. either of them. Um, but if each and every person is killing five to, five to seven people, um, then 
that the, the, the mass murder might not be carried out by one person, but rather than you know being concentrated, just be distributed distributed among everyone. Still, we're, ta we're talking about a matter of scale, right? And if the scale of these societies is greatly reduced, so is the amount of killing. Do you want to take Dave? I have a question. Yeah, yeah so um, if it's okay with you, I just want to respond kind of both you and your name is Kenny? Right? Yep. Okay. Um, and I'm not an argument for primitivist, but if I were to respond to you, I'd say something to the effect of, I don't think that the project of anarcho-primitivism is to like have some sort of like global harmony that is just happy and good. It's really more about like inter or sorry intra-tribal harmony and stability and inter-tribal um, status quo. Even if that status quo is ultimately like ongoing, you know, small-scale conflicts. Number one and number two would be um, I don't know and it, correct me if I'm wrong, but that there was ever in the last 10,000 years any kind of hegemonic empire or large-scale civilization in the North American continent, right? Which would seem to speak to the possibility of such a status quo Wait, being yeah. possible, right? That of any kind of hegemonic empire or civilization, that's why it's supposed to say North American continent, because I, I just don't know about oh, North America. Okay. Yeah, then I'm totally limiting it to North America, but it seems like it's possible, right? Like, that that might be some evidence. I don't know. Just throwing that out there. But uh, uh, also, what I would say right back Kenny. to is basically Kenny. that we have the ability now, and so how do we say no? Kenny. To the exactly. They didn't have the ability, to sort of say no, you can't have the ability. That's fine. Also, Kenny, I'm proposing a moderation now. So, if you want to respond, please raise your hand. <laughs> Um, I guess I, I'm going to draw an analogous situation. Uh, it seems to me what you're advocating for is that all the people who realize the horrors of civilization should go around and spread the message, hey, look, if we don't stop this, it's going to destroy us all. And so what we should do is sort of institute this sort of, uh, I don't know, sort of uh, transition phase through permaculture. And then out of that, eventually we'll wind down into some sort of withering into uh, uh, anarcho primitivist paradise. Uh, does that? Sure. I would also say in addition to that that going on the offensive against civilization to prevent them from... Threatening. Right, and so, and so insofar as there's going to be another civilization that's going to threaten them, they should take precautions in order to protect themselves. Now, the reason I said it was analogous was to be the following. Uh, I, I, Marxist Leninist, I believe that uh, the enlightened vanguard should go around and, and raise class consciousness beyond trade unionism, uh, take over the state, institute socialism as a transition phase to communism. So, that's my... There you go. You can call it or we can move on. So. Or, I, I was going to say, Mike, I think you've done a wonderful job. I would love to talk to you privately or alone, because I've got a bazillion questions. <laughs> However, I move that you guys go to the next speaker and give this guy a break. It's like the wolf pack, man. <laughs> I agree. I don't know if Greg wants to. You want to it's your choice. Uh, I would actually just highly encourage you, uh, again, I would advocate the state, but I would actually highly encourage you to look at Japan um, under the shogunate, um, because with a strong central state, uh, Japan under the shogunate willfully shows, again, with problems of it being a, a semi-feudal society under the shogunate, but willfully chose not to pursue technology. And in fact, it wasn't until the opening of uh, the country by uh, Commodore Perry. And so, you, I mean, you've been asked several times, well, how do you get anarcho primitivism? Uh, I would just encourage you to look at Japan as a possible model for instituting anarcho primitivism. Okay. Uh, let's give Josh a hand.